starting in uh, Matthew chapter 5, the beginning of Matthew chapter 5, verse 1. Uh, we're going to start in Matthew chapter 5, verse 1. Before we do the prayer list, the updated prayer list is in the foyer. If anybody needs one, I'll be happy to get you a copy. I'm not on right now. Just a second. Okay. I got it. Sorry, his his resume um, for consideration for their um, their pastor. Um, Brother Jared um, was given an opportunity to preach here for about ten minutes. Uh, so what I am doing now is I'm making it up to Jared because we went through the prayer list the entire hour and then he only had ten minutes to preach. So tonight we are going to start with a special guest preacher, young Jared Calgill, sir. <laughs> <laughs> I warn. I warn. My name is. I warn God. I'm, I'm always short. Yeah. So I warned Claude, I have a habit of being really short when it comes to sermons, and I'm still getting a lot of echo up here. Is that better? Is that a lot better? Okay. So this week has been incredibly hectic, and many of you know that I'm a philosophy nerd, so we're going to begin in Matthew chapter 5. And this is the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. A little background for this message. When I started preparing it, I took into consideration what the world thinks of Christianity, what people really look at when they come to faith in Christ. When I first came to faith in Christ, a lot of it was, I have to follow these rules in order to achieve a certain goal. It took about three years for me to break out of that habit and that mold and realize that it truly is grace through faith alone. So we have to look at our inward parts to truly grow in Christ. It's more than just a checklist. Our faith isn't do right, do wrong. Our faith is being changed from the inside out to do right. It's the active work of Christ in our lives. Christianity, being as counterculture as it is, wants to flip the world upside down. The world says, follow the checklist. I've done this today, I'm good. I've done this today, I'm good. I've done, have not done this today, so it's a bad day. Christianity's not like that. It's a molding and a changing from the inside. So I've titled this message, being the philosophy nerd that I am, Basic, the Christian Mind. And hopefully this will alter the perception that we have coming into faith, existing in our faith, and working through our faith. I believe that there is an issue in the modern church where it still is. Let's check these boxes to make sure that we're a Christian. That's not how we're called to live. We're called to live changed from the inside. Again, I've always struggled with the, I have to check the boxes. I have to make sure I'm doing this and living right. Instead of seeing the heart of the issue, am I truly changed from the inside? Has Christ truly worked from my inward parts outward? So I searched as best I could, commentaries, different pastors, and the Bible itself, to find a moral compass to start at to gauge whether I'm living the right life or am I just checking boxes and hoping that I'm living as a Christian. So we'll begin in Matthew chapter 5, verse 1. <clears throat> Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. 
Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Let's go to the throne of grace in prayer. Heavenly Father God, thank you for giving us this word, this time to come to you and understand what it truly means to be a Christian, to put on the mind of Christ, to reflect him, to glorify him. Lord God, I ask that you guide us today as we dive deep into you. Help us realize that this change is inward working outward, not outward working inward. Our Christian life is not the culmination of our actions, but our actions are the culminations of the changes that you make in us. Father God, I ask you guide us and direct us, and forgive us where we fail you. In your precious and holy name I pray. Amen. So we're going to begin with this first beatitude. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. When I was a young believer and I first came across this verse... Being the philosophy nerd I am, I looked at the words blessed and poor in spirit and put it together. That just don't make no sense. As redneck simple as I can make it. Blessed and poor in spirit. You can't be blessed and be poor, I thought to myself. You can't be so down in yourself and think you're blessed. But, thank God for revelation and commentaries and good professors and mentors in my life. I was led to this. Blessed are those who mourn, or blessed are those who are poor in spirit, is the realization that we are bankrupt spiritually. Our spiritual state is utterly and totally empty before God. It is bankrupt. Once we truly see that, we'll start to see our dependence on God. To follow this point, if you would turn to Luke 18, verses 9 through 14. Again, that's Luke 18, 9 through 14. What does it truly mean to be spiritually bankrupt, to finally come to that recollection that our spirits are poor, naked, and dead before God, this bankruptcy, this emptiness? Why does this poorness in spirit bring about blessing? Beginning in verse 9. He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I'm not like the other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector standing far off would not even lift up his eyes to heaven. But he beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to to his house justified rather than than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. So being poor in spirit is not being physically poor. It's not the checklist of, I have to make myself poor to receive a blessing. Being poor in spirit has come that realization that because my spirit is naked, bare, and dead, I can go to God who is rich in mercy, love, and peace. That is what it means to be poor in spirit. Recognizing that we are bankrupt, but we have the source of God who is mercy, love, joy, and peace that makes us rich in spirit. We have to see our own state of being poor, naked, and dead to accept that Christ is rich 
full of mercy and full of love. As I studied, I realized that the Beatitudes build upon one another. As we continue in verse 4, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Again, blessed and mourn don't go together. Those are clashing words. (laughs) Blessed are those who mourn. Again, the world's philosophy is, what can I do instead of who I am? So how does mourning bring about blessing? Well, if you look at it from the inside out, we realize that this mourning is mourning our sin. It's a mourning that brings about a radical change. We despise this sin. It eats us up from the inside out. We cook the food and it leaves us with the dishes. It takes all we have and just dumps on the floor. That's why we mourn our sin, because it caused us to be poor in spirit. This sin caused us to be so low, so we mourn it. But Christ being our comforter, being our all in all, when we truly mourn these sins, Christ comes into our lives and shows us in our hearts, this is what I came to do, to forgive these sins, to take away this pain, to take away this mourning. That's the comforter's job. That's Christ's blessing unto us. Continuing, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Meek is a very misunderstood word. We see meek and we think frail. We think weak. We think tattered. In the proper context, meek here is strength under control. I've heard the term as meek as a lion. A lion with all of its strength could tear apart its prey, but sometimes it chooses not to. Again, with these beatitudes building upon one another, once we're poor in spirit, once we mourn our sins, and once we've been comforted, once we've been shown the kingdom of heaven, we're meek. We've learned that, hey, there's more out there than my sin. There's more out there than this detestable, wretched body that I've lived in. In our meekness, this will not allow us to inflate our spiritual value. So again, we're still poor in spirit, and our meekness will not keep us from raising our spiritual value. Again, looking back at the Pharisee in Luke, he talks about all his accomplishments. He's checking the boxes, and he's seeing, oh, I am a really good guy. But if we're meek and we have the strength under control, we can see that our spirit is still the same. Our inward parts are still sinful. We still need to mourn the sinful flesh that we're wrapped in. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who have strength under control, because they will inherit the earth. Meekness also is a resistance to assert ourselves for ourselves. Our meekness is not to exalt us. Our meekness, even though we are inheriting the earth, is not for us. It is for God. When we're poor in spirit and when we're mourning, our meekness points others to Christ. Because I have received strength from Christ, but that strength is not for me, it is for Christ. We're to call to live our lives like a mirror, reflecting God. Continuing on, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. I'm a big guy. I get hungry really easily. I get hungry fairly often. Ask my dad. He's he's shot. He's nodding his head right now. I did. So, have y'all ever been so hungry that it just tears you apart and you would do anything even for a bite of anything? Like, I'm on a diet right now. I've limited myself to tuna, rice, and broccoli and things of that nature. There are some days where I sit in my dorm thinking, man, it just a McDonald's cheeseburger just sounds really good. <laughs> but also hate fast food. I, I despise fast food. But just sitting there being so hungry and just wanting that satisfaction. I want to be full. I want to really know what it feels like to be satiated. That's the hunger and thirst for righteousness that Christ is calling us to in this next beatitude. The willingness to go out and do anything to achieve it. You hunger and thirst for righteousness. You need it. You desire it. Your bones ache for it. 
That's what God wants from us. He doesn't want just to check the box. He wants our inward parts to truly desire everything for him. That's what it is to hunger and thirst for righteousness. It's not just a, yeah, I could go for a bite. It's, oh, I need it. I need it to feel satiated. I need to feel it in my blood and my bones. I want to feel my lungs filled with it. I want to feel my stomach digesting it. I want righteousness. I want it. I need it. But this righteousness also calls us to the next beatitude. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. If we're truly desiring and hungering and thirsting for righteousness, we will realize that Christ has shown us mercy, and in that righteousness, we will show mercy unto others. Again, these beatitudes, they build atop one another. We're not checking boxes. These are inward changes. First, we start poor in spirit. My spirit's broken. It's in debt. It's naked. It's dead. And only Christ can save it. I mourn the sins that I'm in. And Christ comforts me. I begin to come, have strength under control. Because God has comforted me. He's been with me. I hunger and thirst for righteousness. I want it. I need to be satisfied by it. And when I'm hungry and thirsting for this righteousness, I will show the same mercy that my God showed to me. Because even when I was dead, he saved me. So the lost in this world that we are neglecting, I want to reach out to and show them that same mercy that God showed me. Again, these outward changes build on one another. And they're slowly working out. We're slowly growing. We're slowly becoming who God has called us to be. This is the Christian mindset. And this mercy leads to purity in heart. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. I struggled with this one. Pure in heart, for they shall see God. And I struggle for this one because I know I'm sinful. I know my sin in my flesh. I know it. I'm born with it. It's wrapped around me. But Christ was my, my Savior. The purest most loving being ever. The Son of God died for me. And if that doesn't purify me, if that doesn't save my soul, I don't know what will. This purity in heart only comes near the end of this inward to outward growth when we truly come to know God. This purity in heart is the culmination of all those before. We're hungering and thirsting. We're showing mercy. We're being meek. But most importantly, we know that we're still sinners. We're still tore up about it. We're still realizing that only God can fix the sinful state. It's only God. That's the purity in heart. It's only God that I'm seeking. It's only God that I'm living for. It is this pure message that will help us see God and will help others see God in us. Continuing in verse 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. I don't know anyone pure in heart that has been able to make peace. Usually when someone has something contrite or evil in their heart, it usually brings about drama. We don't like drama around here in these good old Southern Baptist churches. <laughs> <laughs> that was humor. Awful humor. But still humor. <laughs> So again, working from inward to outward, once we become pure in heart because we're hungering and thirsting for righteousness and we're showing mercy, we begin to become peacemakers. We want to live peacefully with those around us. Not casting aside our Christian beliefs for peace, but holding so tightly to Christ that we start to leave our own fleshy desires on the wayside. It becomes more about Christ and less about me. I must decrease and he must increase. To be a peacemaker is to be about Christ. You're walking daily, each step. You're growing more and more and more in love with your Savior. And it only comes from this inward to outward expression. Now, about this time, the world starts to realize what you're doing. You're starting to cause trouble. You're starting to be a nice guy for once. You're starting to say, hey... Let me show you love. Let me show you mercy. Blessed are those who persecute you for righteousness' sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. I find it interesting, verse 10. Blessed are those who are 
persecute you for righteousness' sake ends the same way the first beatitude does. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who are, who are poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So once this inward expression really starts to work its way outward, and you're being righteous in God's eyes, not in man's eyes, the world's going to realize it, and you're going to face persecution. But this persecution brings about the same blessing that our poorness in spirit brings along. The kingdom of heaven. We're starting to see the fruit of God in, the, in our lives. And it's working outward. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Again, it's an inward expression working outward. And it's only God working in your life that will bring about this expression. When God finally opens your eyes to being poor in spirit, finally realizing the bankruptcy of your heart, your soul is naked, pitiful, poor, it's dead. And only Christ can bring dead to life. We hear the expression, God's tossed the life preserver out. And you got to grab it. You're dead in your sins. Dead men don't grab life preservers. <laughs> this is an act of God. This inward work is an act of God. And God alone. So I encourage all of you, as we sum this up, to pray, to truly understand what it means to be poor in spirit, to begin this inward to outward process. <laughs> the world needs us. The laborers are few, but it's harvest time. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father God, thank you for giving us this time to explore your word. To explore what it means to have a Christian mind. To truly cling and follow you. Lord God, if any of us struggle with seeing our spiritual state, if any of us struggle with truly mourning our sins, help us, God. Help us, God, become meek for your sake. Help us truly hunger and thirst for righteousness. Help us desire you above all things. Lord God, help us be merciful and pure in heart. Help us become peacemakers for your name's sake, to glorify you in heaven. Lord God, if we face any persecutions when we truly follow you, help us realize that it is all for you and not for us. You're the Son of God. You created us. And we glorify you for that. In your precious and holy name I pray. Amen. Brother Quad. <laughs>
secure the jobs that they need to do. And dear Lord, I thank you for those that are willing to serve. And dear Lord, I thank you for the ones that, uh, that listen, myself included, that we listen. 